and let's get this cranked up. Part three is talking about independence and dependence of random processes. So I think we're going now. <coughs> Multiplication is where you really, really need, need to care about independence or dependence of random processes. So, so far we've been using some assumptions. Okay, I've spoken them sometimes. But they've involved independent random processes. But I, my S is crazy. Um, and independent random processes are easier to deal with. So we're going to focus an awful lot on independent random processes until we get up to the end of the semester, well, after spring break, and then we'll deal with dependent stuff. So independence of random processes um, means that the way one random process occurs does not change the probability of, of the way another random, random process could happen. So the, the certain outcome in one, random pr in one process doesn't change, doesn't shift the probabilities of the outcomes in another random process. You can think of the processes as being chained together. If one of them changes, then, then, then there's some, a, a shift that goes down the chain to the other prob probabilities. If they're independent, then there, there is no chain. They're independent, they're not linked. But if they're dependent, they're linked together in a chain, and the probabilities at one point in the chain will change probabilities at another point in the chain. Now this is just the random processes you're considering, and I hope you can see that it makes no sense to, s to talk about um, the independence of one random process. It's always independence is how re multiple random processes relate to each other. So if you've only got one roll of a die, it's not independent or dependent because there's only one roll of the die. There's only one thing that can happen. <coughs> or sorry, there's only one random process. So a dependent set of random processes. Why do I have the E's missing from my process? Uh, it was a bad day, I guess, when I wrote this. Um, Dependent is the, is the other alternative. It means the way one ronda random process happens does change the probability of another random process happening. So independence is like a bunch of links of a chain that are all broken, and they're not connected to each other. Dependence means things are linked together. So the probability of one thing is changed by the way another thing happens of the random processes you're considering. Independent, much less complicated. So we're going to talk about from time to time this concept of sampling with and without replacement. So the way you sample from a domain can either be with replacement or without replacement. So just imagine, and I'll have a little slide here in a second, um, any kind of sampling, like drawing slips out of a hat, drawing marbles out of a bowl, and that's going to be my example. When you sample with replacement, the setup is that each sample from the same population uh, comes from the same population, and sampling does not change the population. So that's sort of like if you draw slips out of a hat and then you put the slip back in before you draw the next slip. So each sample then becomes independent of all the other samples. Sampling with replacement um, could be uh, conceptualized as a situation where you have a bunch of marbles in a bowl or something, in a dark bowl, in a bag that you can't see. Let's say you have 10 blue marbles and 10 green marbles. There's 10 blue and there's 10 green and they're in your awesomely drawn bowl. Let's say it's a bowl. And blindfolded, you're going to sample three marbles without or with replacement out of that bowl. Sampling three with replacement means you select one. So what's the probability of getting a green one on the first selection? Let's say green is our outcome of interest. The probability. There are 10 green ones. There are 20 total marbles. So it's 10 divided by 20, which is 0.5. So select the first marble and then put it back. Oh, we got a green one. And then we put it back. We, we put it into our little sample space and then we put it back in the population. So we write down on a piece of paper or something, the first one was green. But remember, the green marble went back in. So we're going to take the second selection. What's the probability of getting a green one? It's the same. There are still 10 green ones and there are still 10 blue ones, so probability of green is 10 divided by 20, by all of them, which is 0.5. So we select the second marble. Oh, we got another green one. And then we put it back, but then we write down we got a second green one. Actually, it doesn't matter whether we got a green one or not. Um, so now, what's the probability of getting a green one on the third selection? It's the same, because there are still 10 green marbles in there. Same thing. So we select our third marble. Oh, it was blue this time. And we put it back. 
Yeah, we got a green, a green, a blue. Who cares what we got? The point is that the probability of the selection, of picking a green on the second selection, didn't change no matter what happened on the first selection. And the third selection was not changed by what happened on the first and second selections. So there was no changing of probabilities. Each selection was independent of the other selections. The probabilities are independent of each other. So a common dependent random process is what we call sampling without replacement. Each sample seems like it's from the same population. However, each random process that happens changes the population itself. And so therefore, the probabilities for the next random process, the next sample, are different. This isn't just for, for sampling. This is for anything where the probability of one thing happening changes, or sorry, the way one thing happens changes the probabilities of something else happening. Then those things are dependent on each other. They are no longer independent. So each sample is dependent on what happened in the previous samples. So sampling without replacement. The things get much more complicated. Uh, you, you work into section 2.2, conditional probability. Um, but this is just to demonstrate. That section is not required for this class, but this is just to demonstrate you know, where the complications come from. So same situation, 10 blue and 10 green marbles. You're going to randomly sample three marbles, but this time without replacement there will be dependent probabilities going on. And it can work out a million different ways, probably literally, but I'll just talk about one way for a demonstration. So what's the probability of picking a green marble on the first selection? The same as before. 10 things could happen that we're interested in, but 20 total things might happen, so it's 0.5. So let's select the first marble and keep it out. There we go. It was green. Now, we drew a green one. Now it actually matters what happened on the first selection to figure out what will happen for the second one. What's the probability of getting green? There are only nine marbles left that are green. You can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are only nine green marbles left, but there are ten blue marbles left. So the probability now, we're interested in one of nine things that could happen. That's the, prob that's the probability of getting a green. We're interested in nine things that could happen, getting a green, divided by all the things that could happen. So nine divided by 19. It's actually slightly lower. It's 0.47 now. So we select the second marble, and we keep it out. <gasps> it was green again, because, you know, I made these PowerPoint slides. It's not actually random. Let's pretend it was random. So we select the second marble, and we keep it out. Oh, it was green again. Uh-oh, now the population has changed again. What's the probability of selecting a green marble on the third try? Yeah, now there are only 8 green marbles. So it's 8 divided by 8 plus 10. So it's actually gotten a little 0.44. Now the probabilities can go up and down depending on whether you get a green or a blue. And you can think about this and you can practice it if you want. You can work through all the complications. But this is an important thing to understand. Sampling without replacement. It's a dependent set of processes. Each sample is dependent on what happened in the samples before it. The probabilities of getting certain things in each sample have been changed depending on the exact way that the previous sampling happened. And there are a lot of dependent processes. So let's just, there's no more probabilities associated. So there we go. What if we did a fourth selection? Then the probability of green would now be, because the second one was blue, or the third one was blue, would be 8 divided by 8 plus 9. You can barely see that. Anyway, it's 0.47. It went back up to this one because we drew a blue one and it kind of evened things out a little bit. So everything just depends on exactly what happened in previous tries. So the independence and dependence are prominent in what's called the gambler's fallacy. The gambler's fallacy is a failure to think accurately about independent and dependent random processes. Um, and this, uh, this only works for certain gambling games. Some gambling games, the gambler's fallacy is a little more true, but most gambling games it's not. In reality, each new hand and new game of, of most gambling games is independent of all the last ones. I think blackjack might be a little different. But let's say you're, spin you're playing roulette. You're playing a slot machine. Each time you pull that handle, you've reset back to zero. Your probability of winning on that try is exactly the same as your probability of winning at any other time you pulled that handle. They make the machines that way on purpose because they can be very predictable in how much money they'll make. However, your subjective feeling might be that each time you pull that handle, the probability depends on the last ones. You're saying, I've lost a lot, so now it's time for me to win. That is a totally screwed up way of thinking, and it's not true. 
So that's wrong. The probability of winning is the same every trial. It's like it resets every single time, but only for independent random processes. Um, so probability can get really crazy with you. With independent random processes, you have to think of how many independent random processes you're considering to make up one big random process. It's events. How many trials make up one random process? Because we can start clumping events together into these complex events. Simple events into complex events over and over and over again until you get really complicated stuff. And that's where the real weird complications of probability come in and that's where it's kind of hard to keep things straight. So are we just talking about one random independent trial at a time? So what's the probability of winning this one hand in poker? Or are we talking several groups together? What's the probability of winning every hand in video poker today? Or what's the probability of winning at least one hand? That frame of reference and grouping of probabilities is extremely important and it totally changes probability, the way probabilities happen and the way we calculate them. And this determines your definition of what is a random process or what is an event, something like that. So if you change the way you group those things together, then you have changed the probability, which we call P. So as an example, um, if the probability of losing one hand of blackjack is 0.7, let's do, let, oh, I picked a terrible example. So let's assume it's totally independent. Then what's the probability of losing five times in five hands? It's actually not that you need to know. It's the probability of, well, you can figure it out. If they're totally independent, if each hand is independent of the other hands, then the probability is 0.70 times 0.70 times 0.70 five times, which is 0.70 to the fifth power. It's just a cheaper, easier way of saying that. So it's about 0.168. So it's much less likely that you'll lose all five hands. Now, I don't know if the probability is 0.7. It might be higher. But if you've already lost four times in a row, it doesn't matter. The probability of losing on the fifth time is still 0.7 because these numbers only increase if you're taking the entire group and saying what's the probability of at least this or all of these, this and this and this or this or this or this. Those groupings change things. You're, you're doing ands and ors when you group things and that changes the probabilities. But when you change your frame of reference back to a single, single event, then you go back to the probability of that single event. So even if you've lost four times in a row, that doesn't mean you're due to win again. The probability of losing the next hand is still 0.7, as crazy as that might sound. So real sampling is almost always independent or it's almost always effectively independent. Now we say sampling with replacement even though we don't really replace people in the population. So inferential statistical theories are always for like an infinite n and for independent sampling. Our populations are, are usually large but not infinite. Now the book has a section on sampling from small populations. We're not going to mess with that very much. We're going to use traditional stats, which is sampling from large populations. So large that we can pretend that we're always sampling with replacement. So our samples are, each sample is always independent of all other samples. And once you get a big enough sample, even if the sample is only a few thousand people or a population, then the samples usually can be considered um, independent as long as you're not sampling millions of times. So the difference between what we do and what the theories say usually doesn't matter. Um, but keep an eye out for when it might matter. So pretending there's an infinite n and that our samples are all um, independent, this is called an assumption. Now we know assumptions aren't ever technically all the way true, but as long as they're true enough, then things will work. Then our results will be accurate enough that we're okay. Other assumptions are usually more important than this, and we forget about this sampling with replacement or independence of samples is what the assumption really is. But it's always there. And I think that is the end. I'm going to stop talking about this now, and maybe I'll have a chance to do the 2.5-ish type stuff later.